Oh. Good morning. Sunday school is about the wife's role in marriage. This is number two, week two this week. Last week we waded through the, the difficult topic of submission. The wife is commanded to submit to her husband. Ephesians 5 says, Wives, submit to yourselves or be subject to your own husbands as unto the Lord. The husband is head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so, all, so the wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. So three times in three verses, it, it says, wives, you're, you're submitting, you're subjecting yourself to your husband. And that is so misunderstood on the one hand, but so abused on the other hand, that then wives think, well, that must not apply to me. I'm going to just forget about that command, and I'll try to live out God's other commands for me. It doesn't work very well. Uh, I, I think we men need to be a little sympathetic about our wives, because we are to submit to our bosses, we are to submit to our government. And neither our bosses nor the government are perfect. In fact, many times they're very, very sinful, very, very misled, or very, very malicious, actually purposeful in asking us to do things that are wrong. And how are we to respond to that? Well, we have to submit. We have to say, Lord, I'm gonna humble myself, I'm going to as much as I can, obey the, the rule, those that are in authority over me, and I'm gonna to seek to obey you. We talked about what submission isn't. It doesn't mean that the wife is inferior. It, it, it doesn't mean that there's a, a higher thought process that the husband has, therefore the wives have to submit to him because she doesn't think very clearly. It doesn't mean that the husband is infallible or always right. I know a lot of husbands that think they are. They act that way, but they're not. So we have to take that into consideration and actually include into our theology, how does the wife respond when the husband asks her to do things that are not right, either because he doesn't understand or because he's being malicious. It doesn't mean that the wife can't think, she can't be productive on her own. Many wives are very productive, are very bright, and, and are able to think very clearly. So what is submission? The, the primary understanding is a, a rank. So think of military rank, that one is under the other. It's an organizational thing, not a value type of thing. Now in in the military, there are many people with rank who, who use it in an ugly way. But I don't know if you remember in White Christmas how you know, they're looking at the, at the general. Uh, they're at, this is after the war. You know, we ate, then he ate. We slept, then he slept. You know, so he, the general was actually a servant serving the people under him. And he wasn't lording it over them. He, he was, yeah, he was in charge, but he w wasn't nasty about it. Um, we talked about 1 Peter 3, how there's this hidden spirit of the heart that the wife is showing, and, and she's putting herself in, in rank under and trying to fill in the blanks. Um, submission is also a picture of Christ and the church, and the church obeying Christ, and we, we talked about that quite a bit. Again, it's not an absolute obedience, but it is, uh, I'm putting myself in rank under the husband because that's how God designed it. Uh, today, we're, we've got two more points to go. God wants wives not only to be submissive, but to be fitting helpers. Helpers suitable, filling in the missing spots in their husbands. And then the next one we'll get to is God wants wives to reverence their husbands. 
Genesis 2, verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him, or a helper fitting for him. King James, a helper meet for him. It just means it's fitting. When you think about the word helper, it's not necessarily a very, uh, how do I want to say it? It's kind of insignificant. In, in today's thought process. So if I'm the electrician's helper, that means I'm a nobody, I'm the grunt. Well, that's not exactly what this means. In the Bible, God is known as our helper. He fills in where we cannot do it ourselves. Um, God has made us fairly independent. He, he's made us so we can do a lot of things on our own. He doesn't want us to. He wants us to rely on him for everything to give him credit for everything. But at the same time, God is called our helper in that there's many things we cannot do on our own. So think about that in relation to the wife. God says, he's alone, he can't do it himself. I'm gonna make a helper fitting, suitable for him. So it's the opposite of demeaning. It is completing, it's complementing, it is corresponding to, it's fitting to, it's naturally perfectly adapted to the other to fill in and make up what he is lacking on his own. A lot of things that we could do, again, thinking about God and being our helper. I don't know how often you use Bible software, but it's an interesting thing to just go through and look up help or helper and see all the times God helps us and the ways he helps us then to think about it with our with our wives. Now, letter B, uh, we talked about the, the definition there, this insignificant sense in our society that it means to say you're just a help, he's just my helper. Well, no, uh, she is an indispensable filling in the blanks where I am weak. So letter B is specific ways that we can fulfill this. And Wayne Mack gives some suggestions. I want to read several passages first, and then we will develop them. Let's go to Proverbs 31. And Proverbs 31 is often used as a club by husbands or by men in general. Why can't you be like this? Here's what God wants you to be like. Well, no, that's not at all what we want to use it as. We want to say, here's some instruction. Here is a godly woman. And what can we learn from her? The primary verses I want to read, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but Proverbs 31, starting in verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman or price as far above rubies? This is a valuable person because of the way God has worked in her life. And then verse 11, the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. He trusts her. He can give her tasks. He can, he can say, the house is yours, run with it. And he doesn't worry that he's going to to go behind financially or any other way. She will do him good, verse 12, and not evil all the days of her life. And then it describes in the next verses how she goes and applies that. Verse 20, she stretches out her hand to the poor. She stretches out her hands to the needy. She's helping others, uh, etc. Okay, Ephesians 5, Ephesians 4, I'm sorry. Ephesians chapter 4. These are more general instructions for us uh, about what we should all be living like, but let's just think if, if a wife is living this way, how she can fill in the blanks with her husband, how she can complement her husband. So Ephesians 4, starting verse 25. Putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one of another. 
and we're being honest with each other. Um, in the following verses, we get down to verse 31. Well, let's say 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearer. You're trying to do and speak in ways that are helpful, not harmful. In verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all maliciousness. So fix your attitude. And then 32, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake is forgiving you. Then the next New Testament book, Philippians chapter 4. There's other passages that are in your notes here, and you can look them up at some point. Sure. We're just getting a baseline for some things to apply to our lives. Ephesians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful or anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, if there's any virtue or praise, think on these things. Those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Uh, verse 10, Paul is talking about himself. Remember, he's in prison and what is he's writing Philippians. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, wherein you also were careful, but you lacked opportunity. That you wanted to help me, but you didn't have the opportunity. Verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed, both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So now let's go back now to our notes and this list of 15 ways that a wife can complete or fit, fittingly help her husband. The first one is making the home a safe place. Sometimes we cut each other down instead of building each other up. Sometimes we remind each other often of our faults and mistakes rather than encouraging each other that there are many things that they are getting right and that this mistake, you'll get it better next time. Uh, one of the suggestions is to correct them if it's only if it's absolutely necessary. You haven't got to correct them about everything. Again, husbands can learn the same the same thing, but yeah, try to keep your home in order, not in a shambles, not disorder, not confusion, but avoid the danger of making the house a showplace where nobody dares touch anything. <coughs> Betsy and I had an individual supporter for years who had white carpets all through the house and knickknacks everywhere, and we went with the kids, and we didn't, we didn't dare. <laughs> We had to hold the kids by their arms all the time because, man, they were always into something. And you know, so there's a balance between the two of, of just making your house a homey place, a place where, where everything is, is livable. Next one is being trustworthy, being dependable. You know, as we go through these, think about, think about comments you have and then maybe scribble them down and then we can come back and we want to hear what you have to say about these. Be trustworthy, be dependable. Um, if your husband gives you an assignment, do it the best you can. Um, if you say you're going to do something, do it to you the best of your ability. You know, help your husband to be able to count on you. Number three, maintain a good attitude. And we read several verses about that. Uh, there's other passages about uh, what wisdom from above looks like in James 3, 
and there's other verses in Proverbs 31 that would aim towards this as well. Uh, to fit in each other's and, and help each other and to fill in where each other is weak, uh, it, it helps to do so with a good attitude, not uh, sarcastically or bitingly or grudgingly. Number four, discuss things, talk about things, communicate things in an open way, a loving way, honest way. Don't manipulate, don't hide, don't hint. Just if you want something, tell them. We guys are often clueless. You say, isn't that the truth? Well, yeah, it is. So just tell us and be honest about it, open. Number five, be satisfied with where God has you. Be content, as we read in Philippians 4. Be, t be content with how God made you. He made you a female. Be content with where God has placed you. Be content with the possessions you have. Be content with the position you have, with the tasks you have. Number six, be long-suffering, be forgiving, forbe be forbearing. We read that in Ephesians 4. Uh, put up with us. You know, we guys are a lot to put up with, I understand. But, you know, be long-suffering. Number seven, show an interest in your husband's problems and concerns. You know, don't look on your own things only, but look on the needs of others. I, I understand, men, we need to live the same way, but wives, this is a way that you can practice being a fitting helper for your husband. Number eight, be industrious, be frugal, be diligent, be ambitious, be creative. You're part of the team, you're part of the family. Be a part of the solution for the family finances. Be a part of the solution to the family's needs. Uh, be creative and industrious and ambitious as you do so. A little conversation Betsy and I had just this week was, uh, we, as much as we can, hang up our clothes to dry. I say, Boy, that's a lot of work hanging up all these socks and everything. So, so we've made a hanger, it's a rack that hangs up here. There's little clothespins that hang, hang down on strings and, and we can hang up all the socks. And that was something our kids could do when they were little. So, yeah, that's a lot of work. Well, yeah, it's a lot of work, but if you watched your electric meter go when you turn on the dryer, um, about 10 years ago, I figured it was a dollar a load. Now it's a lot more than that. So, so as you hang up your clothes, it's a dollar. Well, it's only a dollar, but, but it's something that we trained our children with and our children like to hang up their clothes now. Um, it, it's just one of the ways, that, just an illustration. Um, you know, try to, try to plan out um, how, how the food is gonna go in the fridge so you're not throwing away half of it. And husbands cooperate with that. Don't complain about your wife's plans, etc. A lot of things like that. Um, number nine, offer suggestions, offer advice, offer corrections when needed, but do it in a loving fashion. Um, often we husbands need input. Um, do so not in a nagging way, but in a, in a helpful way. Number 10, keep yourself beautiful, especially inside. That's what the first Peter three passage is about, this hidden person of the heart that that reflects the beauty of the Lord shining in her. Number 11, maintain a good spiritual life yourself. Number 12, cooperate with him in raising children. Uh, we talked about this already. We'll get into more of this in another month or so when we get into parenting. No couple ever gets married and agrees with how the kids are to be raised. No couple ever does that. We all have different backgrounds. We all have different personalities. And you have to get together. You have to think through. And you have to cooperate in that process. Thirteen, build loyalty to him and the children. You know, speak well of him to the children. If the children speak down about dad, you, you try to be loyal to him and teach them how to speak well of their dad. Often the wives don't have respect for the husbands, and it shows, and then the kids pick up 
that disrespect. Now, this is difficult because there are many things about we husbands to, to frown on, to, to, to smirk about, to pick on, to be angry about, many things. So this is a hard thing you have. Uh, husbands, do the same for your wives. Uh, we'll get into this a lot more in parenting, but kids love to pit one parent against the other. They become very good at it. They become very good at understanding what mom wants and what dad wants. So when the kid wants something, they go to the, per the parents who they know will affirm them in that. So, so learn about each other as, as a married couple and be loyal. 14, be grateful, express your appreciation. Verse 15, I mean, number 15, show confidence in his decisions. He said, oh boy, every decision he ever makes is a, is a fiasco. How, how am I supposed to show confidence in that? Honey, I'm, I'm, sure you, I'm sure you can make a good decision here. Have you thought about this, this, and this? You know, again, help him. Um, but sh showing confidence gives him confidence. Showing confidence helps him to, to care about the decisions he makes. Honey, you, I, I know that you realize that your decisions really affect our whole family, and I appreciate you, you, you caring so much about those decisions and, and trying to make good decisions. You know, so so you're, you're trying to help him along as he makes decisions. If you're always critical, he's going to be indecisive, he, he's going to be defensive, or he's going to just be downright belligerent and, and stubborn, and he's going to make the decisions without taking you into account. So show confidence in his decisions. Um, ask questions if you need to, but, but show confidence in him. Show so interact with, with some of those or other ways you can think of. How can the wife be a fitting helper in, in these ways or in other ways? You know, we threw out a whole bunch of things in a hurry. Wives don't dare say anything. Husbands don't dare say anything. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I I don't. I'm not a good storyteller, but I could I could tell a whole bunch of stories. Um, one that Betsy uses. I'll, I'll just use this one. We were missionaries on pre fields, so that means we we're going to church to church to church to church, trying to raise financial support and prayer support, trying to get people to to be on our team as we came to Maine as missionaries. And I was working full time, I was tired, I was sick most of the time, my body just couldn't handle it, we had little kids, poor Betsy was overloaded. And then Kittery, Pastor and Kittery, who's Dick Lloyd, whose parents were charter members here, and, and Dick's dad is the one who did all of the, the combing of the wood grain in the building here. But he invited us to come and work with the church in Kittery to be able to get us into Maine and working at the same time as still flexible on pre-field. And Betsy just wasn't comfortable. For, for, she had a few reasons in her mind. I don't think I want to do that. And I listened and I listened and I talked with a lot of other people and I listened to Betsy some more and and asked her a whole bunch of questions and heard her and she still felt uncomfortable. And normally I would not encourage a husband to make decisions that your wife is uncomfortable with. But I made the decision. I, let's, I, I really think God wants us to move to Kittery. And we moved to Kittery and within a year Betsy says, you know, you heard me. You listened to me. You considered my concerns, and you made the right decision. So that was encouraging to me, but that's an illustration about how the negotiation goes in, 
this is somewhat going back to the submission thing, but also her helping me try to think through, is this a wise decision or not? And, and that was hard for her to be my helper in that situation. So there are a lot of those day after day, week after week. Any illustrations, any stories you want to tell on yourselves? Uh, meals are always things to tell stories about. Um, if you ask Betsy about hockey pucks, she will know exactly what we're talking about and we're able to laugh about it. Um, it didn't go, it, whatever it was she was cooking, and you'll have to ask her, it didn't go well. But then there's a lot of things that, that I've broken as well that, that she can joke about too. Let me do a little monologue type of thing here. Companionship, which is what marriage is. This is a covenant of being a companion. Uh, you, you, are, you are your husband's companion in life. You, you're going through this together. And, and I would encourage you to see yourself in that way. Uh, you can help him emotionally. Uh, yes, there will be the boys that he goes and spends time with. I, I have flyers here for the Pittston Farm Retreat for you guys that are interested. It's a fun place to go with the boys. Shoot your guns, you know, things like that. They told us we couldn't bring the potato cannons anymore. That was a fun, a fun year that we took those. Um, so, so yeah, there will be the boys, but, but you should be his primary companion, and and he should see you as his companion. Um, physically, um, you you're the only one that can be intimate with your husband. In God's eyes, that's um, something you share with him. It's a way you can help him. Spiritually, does your relationship with your husband help him spiritually or hold him back? It, maybe he's not very good at, at leading in family devotions. But if he does try to lead you in family devotions, do you follow him? Do you, do you encourage him in that? Or do you complain and, and hold him back from that? Um, as a parent, you know, work together. You, as a wife, really have a lot of influence on your children. Um, you, you are helping your husband a lot in this. It, it should not weigh, and husbands listen carefully, it shouldn't, the parenting is not your wife's responsibility, it's yours. But wife, you are a front, you are the front line person in this. You are a first responder so to speak. Domestically, uh, some of us husbands are just slobs. Most of us are not very creative about making a house look like a home. So, so wives, you can help us that way. Intellectually, help us to think clearly, help us to, help us to, to stretch our brains out. Uh, Yes, look to your husband for counsel, but, but be willing to humbly give your two cents. Funny story, this, this week, the Pastors Fellowship on Facebook. Why do we call it the widow's might? The, the, the parable of the widow's might or the story of the widow's might instead of her giving her two cents. <laughs> Just one of those funny things that you, you talk about. Um, and then ministry. Your husband has a ministry. You have a ministry, but your husband has a ministry God has called him to. How are you helping him to be effective in that? A anything else you're thinking about relating to helping? Remember that the picture is that of a puzzle, filling in the blanks where each other is, is, is weak or lacking. Not, I'm just his helper, I'm just handing wrenches. Or, or, or something like that. It's no, you're filling in in areas where he could not do it alone. Okay, the third main point here, the first was submission, the second is a fitting helper, the third is 
God wants wives to reverence their husbands. Ephesians 5, uh, where this entire section about husband and wife relationships, husbands love your wives and then wives submit to your own husbands. Uh, but verse 33, as it wraps up the husband-wife relationship, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular specifically, you wives, so love his wife, even as himself, husbands, um, you specifically love your wife, even as yourself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. It's so interesting that God doesn't tell the wives, command the wives to love their husbands. Yes, over in Titus, it says, older women teach the young women to love their, their, their husbands and children. So, so, yeah, you are to love your husband, but it's not a specific command to do so. Husbands love your wives, but wives respect, reverence your husband. Probably we're given commands like that because husbands have a hard time loving their wives harder than the wives have loving their husbands, and then the wives have a hard time respecting their husbands. What does it mean, highly regard, um, honor him, prefer him, esteem him, look up to him, praise him, admire him, um, re reverence him, don't try to change him. Here's where I often put in the, the three words that the bride is thinking as she's planning her wedding. There's the aisle, and then there's the altar, and then there's him. So I'll alter him. And, and, and she's thinking she's going to change her husband. Um, how many of us go into marriage, husbands or wives, thinking that we'll change our spouse? No. You, you look at him for what he is, not for what you want him to be. And reverence him for that. Specific ways you can fulfill this. I don't remember. Did, did I give you notes on that, is it, or is that a blank? Okay, there's notes here. Okay. Um, so a few points about fulfilling this reverence in him. You are not the Holy Spirit. That's helpful to remember. So, so you, you're not the, the Jiminy Cricket on the shoulder, you know, whispering in his ear the whole time. Uh, remember that. Yes, you are his helper, but you're not the Holy Spirit. You communicate, but you let the Holy Spirit do his work. Express thankfulness for him. Uh, something about when we say things of gratefulness, it actually helps us to, to make sure we are being grateful, are being thankful. So express thankfulness. Praise him when he does well. Encourage him when he falls. Uh, look, you messed up this time. We, we will do better next time. I'll, I'll help you. Uh, but praise him when he does well. Um, be satisfied despite your circumstances. Uh, I, I've known a lot of wives that were so supportive with husbands that were doing their best, but they didn't have a whole lot. Um, be joyful in spite of your emotions, in spite of your circumstances. Uh, Love him as he is. Remember that you decided to marry him. That, that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, kind of off to the side, deal with your own log first. Math, what that is talking about in Matthew 7 is here's the guy with this big beam sticking out of his eye. And he's trying to pick the speck out of his brother's eye. And Jesus says, Come on, stop, think, get this beam out of your own eye first. Then you would see clearly. So when you're, you're feeling critical, when you're trying to help your husband with this little speck, make sure that you get whatever is in the way out of the way first. Give your rights to God. I have my rights. Well, give them to God. Let God deal with them and, and trust him with them. Communicate biblically in love, and we will get to that soon in our study in coming weeks. Comments about any of those? 
Okay, let us see the responsibility of the wife is to respect her husband. That's a command, not an option. The, husband, the wife can't use the excuse that he doesn't deserve it. Well, yeah, we, we tend to agree with you on that, that we don't deserve it. But God commands this in spite of imperfections. God has a plan. It's a wise plan. He knows how he made us. And God's plan works perfectly when we trust him with it. Anything to add to any of that? Let's kind of fill in the blanks a little bit. Let, let's think a little bit about a woman's place is in the home. Ever hear that? And what in the world does that mean when we say something like that? Is a woman's place in the home? Where, where does that statement come from? Where, where does that thought come from? Is it only cultural? Is it, is it something that male chauvinists came up with just to squash their wives? Uh, in the same way that maybe a husband who only buys cars that are standards when he knows his wife can't drive a standard, just to keep her in her place. Is this some kind of slavery, some kind of imprisonment? I, I want to think about this a little while. Um, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is not in your notes. I'm just filling in a few minutes here. But it's something we hadn't dealt with in the rest of our study. So, so I thought it would be good for us to talk about. 1 Timothy 5, verse 14. 1 Timothy 5, 14. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, or manage the house, and give no occasion for the adversary to speak reproachful, reproachfully. Younger women marry, bear children, manage the house. I thought the husband was to, to be the leader of the house. It's interesting. She's to keep house. She's to manage the house. She's to e even rule the house. Now over a few pages to second, I mean to Titus. Titus chapter 2. Titus 2 and verse 4. And here we have the older women teaching the younger women how to be wives and mothers. Verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers of at home, or workers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And we, we have to try to figure out what this means, to be a keeper at home, to be a, a worker at home, to manage the household, to rule the household, you might say. So workers is an action term. There's something that's going on there that she's doing. At home is, is this sphere, the primary sphere of influence that she has, the center of her responsibility, you might say, according to these passages, is at home. Uh, we could go to Proverbs 31, and, and we may, if we have time in a few minutes, just to see how her focus was caring for the family, but in order to care for the family, she went to the, to the market and bought and sold. Um, there was money involved. Where it's, she was earning money, but then there were things that she was making and selling, and then things she was buying to be able to care for her household, for her home, the center, her sphere, uh, the, the circle in which she is responsible is, is primarily at home. Keep. Uh, she's the master of the house. She's the ruler of this domain, you might say. And I just wonder if, if wives, you see yourselves as diligent and active in keeping house. Do you see that as a, a satisfaction? 
as something that you enjoy and are satisfied doing, of keeping house. Um, even if you're working outside the home, uh, do you see this as, as something that God has is, is assigned to you and it's a, a blessing to do it? Uh, thinking about Proverbs 31, and I think we're somewhat familiar with it, how she, how she keeps her home and her husband trusts her to keep her, their home, but then she's doing business in the process. She's keeping a neat home, a clean home. We already talked about that earlier in our time together. Um, she took care of food. Uh, so in this circle of responsibility of managing the house, there seems to be the neatness, the cleanliness. It doesn't mean you have to do it all, but you're, you're, you're in charge of that, you might say. It doesn't mean your husband can't help you with that. It doesn't mean your children can't help you, but you're kind of in charge of that. You're not, it's not a perfectionistic thing. You're, you're just seeing this as under your responsibility. Um, feeding your family, trying to put nutritious food on the table. Uh, again, Proverbs 31 seems to talk about that some. Clothing, her family was well clothed. And it doesn't have to be expensive. Um, one of the things that Betsy loves to do right now is down in Winthrop, there's what they call the free store. Is there still one over in Rumford? I don't remember. But, uh, but before, Betsy went to Connecticut for this week. Made a couple trips week after week down to Winthrop to collect size one, size four, size, you know, in the different clothing items. And that was a joy to be involved in clothing even her grandchildren. A ministry was in the list, um, using the home as, as, a, as a, the central place where ministry grows out of. So you can invite people to your home, but then you see yourself as reaching out from there to minister to other believers. And then the, the woman in Proverbs 31 obviously did outside work. And if in filling in the blanks, again, this picture of, of the wife helping her husband, if it's required to work outside the home, th that's perfectly acceptable when you remember that, again, we read, 1 Timothy 5 and Titus 2, this keeper at home, the managing of the home. Um, try to be home when your husband is, when your family is. Th this is difficult uh, when you have two parents working with children and you often then arrange different schedules, the, the two shifts, so that one can care for the children while the other is away. It winds up being very difficult. And, and it may mean you, you scrounge and you scrimp and you don't work during that time period. We didn't have a whole lot when our kids were younger, but Betsy didn't work when our kids were younger. And we, we were living on pennies and sometimes no pennies. But we're glad for that, for Betsy to be able to stay home. But if you have to work, that, that's okay. But take this into account that you're trying to be the manager of the home and setting the tone, setting the atmosphere, um, a, a cheerful heart, uh, joyful in industry, um, teach your kids to love, to work. Uh, it's fun watching Rachel now with our grandkids and, and even Nathan and Misty with our grandkids and making a mess, washing the dishes and having to run the dishes through a second time or a third time and say, no, nah, you better do this again. Oh, that's great. And, and enjoying it, enjoying getting all, all soap sudsy and everything. Um, so be joyful yourself. Teach your kids to to have this atmosphere of joy in the family. Meet the needs of your family. Uh, look for ways to, again, reach outside the family and meet needs of others. There are seasons of life, I've already mentioned that a little bit, where you, you may be at home and, and you may feel really lonely. Figure out how to call somebody, figure out how to 
make connections with people in, in these seasons of, of being alone. Make sure you're spending time with the Lord yourself. And, and sometimes that's really difficult. Sometimes that will mean you don't even have time to sit down and read your Bible, but you may put on your Bible app and have it play while you're doing the dishes or making supper or something. Uh, have Christian uh, music to play, maybe Christian radio to listen to, but have ways of focus in yourself during these times. Let's see what else have I got here? Comments or, or additions to the wife being a keeper at home. We want to obey God. We want to understand what he's talking about. And we, as we put together the rest of scripture, we see that the wife isn't, always, isn't stuck at home. But that is the sphere of her responsibility that she then may work outside the home to, to help care for that. But, but her sphere, her primary focus is at home. I hope that helps you think. Again, submission, which means husbands, we have a lot of weight of, of being worthy leaders. They are not our slaves. They are not our subjects. We are not the king. We are not the Lord of the universe. Only, only Jesus is. And we follow him, Ephesians 5, the husbands, Christ is head of the husband, and, and the husband is then to lead his wife. There are extras there in your notes about how to show love to your husband. There's a log list for a wife and mother, questions to ask about your own life. These are checkups for each of us. And then there's a, kind of a similar thing, a scorecard for wives that, that I attach there as well. And those, those are helpful. Husbands, we, I, I hope that you went through yours to, to check on yourselves. Okay, number four, next week, we will get into communication in marriage. How to talk. And one of the big complaints for wives is, my husband never talks to me. And, and that, that is often true. And sometimes I'm a little snarky about it. So the, the one item that Betsy hasn't told me about that I find out about through a phone call from somebody else, my wife never tells me anything. You, and I'm more teasing myself than, than her because usually it's me that forgets to tell Betsy rather than the other way around. But, but we, we try to be light humored about it and, and make jokes about it. Okay, let's close in prayer. We'll 